if, if you pull just anyone off the street and ask them to name Toto songs, many would probably just throw out Africa first. What do you yeah. think was the secret sauce in that song? Was it the rhythm, a specific hook, the, a particular I think, I, think the, I think it was the hypnotic rhythm. And I think it was the fact that there was, uh, uh, it, it had some interesting changes harmonically to it. I think that it was a little quirky uh, lyrically and uh, uh, different, but people liked the way it sang. And uh, uh, I think there was just something different about it that made it so it wasn't like anybody else you've ever heard. Uh, it was a, almost a global, global music uh, before global music was around. And uh, um, it, I think that's, that's what made its uniqueness. Some don't realize until they actually see Toto live that you sing the verses in the song. How did you guys pick who would sing what on that song? And is it well, true that the song almost didn't make the album? It's true the song almost didn't make the album. Uh, Bobby Kimball was uh, um, recruited to uh, and asked or asked to do the, the chorus vocals because he was the high singer in the band. But everybody else, including Bobby, Lukather, and uh, both tried to do the verses and it was so wordy and a little bit complicated for their style of singing that I was the only one that could actually sing my own words that I had written. So I was the low man in the totem pole. So I got to sing it. And uh, it's funny how things turn out. You know, that ended up being our number one record. And uh, uh, again, it wasn't uh, supposed to go on the album. It was an 11th hour uh, song that was written. Uh, we had the whole album done. And I, I had came up with this uh, verse and this chorus on Africa and asked Jeff Ricardo to write a special beat for it, a hypnotic beat that would uh, be indicative of South Africa. And uh, he came up with something really special. And uh, uh, again, that album, uh, everybody kept telling me to save it for my solo record, uh, Africa, which is, a, which is a polite way of telling you it's not going on our record. You know, so uh, I'm very happy that it made it. And uh, it's been a, a, um, a real landmark song, uh, iconic song in Toto's live repertoire as well. And some people think the song has a romantic meaning. But as I understand it, the song is just truly about Africa, correct? Well, yes, but there's some romance involved. There's a guy, uh, the, I think there's a, the protagonist is discovering himself. And I think he's torn between uh, the... Con uh, working in Africa and having a, a, a personal life with a, with a mate, finding a mate, you know what I mean? So uh, I think he's uh, conflicted and uh, that's about all I have to say about that. Is there a particular meaning behind bless the rains down in Africa? Well, the way I got that was because I'd gone to about the all boys uh, college prep I'd gone to was run by um, uh, brothers from the seminar and some of them had been social workers in Africa before they came uh, back uh, to, to California. And they said, uh, I said, what did, what did you do? What was it like down there? And they said, well, we, we would do, go things like bless the village. They bless babies. They bless the crops when they grow. And sometimes they build, if, it, if it wasn't raining and when it finally rained, they bless the rain. And so I kind of got that from uh, that message from them. And I thought it was, it just came out when I was singing the song, I just started singing the chorus and these lines just kept, they just kept pouring out of me. So uh, I just let them, I didn't deny it and uh, let it happen magically. It just kind of flowed. Looking back, which is your personal favorite Toto album? Or is that like kind of trying to choose which child is your favorite? It really is, you know, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say I have a uh, a personal affinity for the very first album, but I think our finest work to date is on Total Four album. I think is all in all a really great album as albums go. It's, it's a total album, you know, and I think it has good production on it. I think it has, the songs are very good. It's very exemplatory of how Total sounds is that album. I, I'm, I'm curious if you knew which album or song was your dad's favorite being as such an accomplished musician himself. Did he have one? Did he ever tell you? I think he liked uh, Won't Hold You Back. He worked on that with James Newton Howard and myself, and he helped uh, arrange the uh, strings and, uh, and the woodwinds and the harp and all the extra 
instruments on it, along with James Newton Howard and myself. And uh, I think he loved the fact we used the LSO on it. How did Hold the Line fall into place? Hold the Line fell into place. I had just moved away from home and got my first apartment. And I got, uh, it was really small, so I could only fit a little upright piano in there. And the, the first thing I started playing when I got it was I sat down and started playing the Hold the Line riff. And I must have played it for two or three days because people were pounding on my door to stop playing the, this riff. And so I finally finished writing a little verse for it. And we decided to go down and audition the song to the band who we just hired Bobby Kimball and uh, Lukather was there and David Hungate and Jeff and myself. And we played Hold the Line and we played it just about how it sounds on the record the first time we played it. It sounded, it sounded just like that. And uh, we knew we had something magical and that song, uh, we should record the song. Looking back, you were in on some of what I would consider some of the greatest studio sessions in history. One that comes in mind involves you, Steve, Paul, McCartney, uh, Michael Jackson, George Martin, Quincy Jones, working on The Girl Is Mine. What sticks yeah. out to you about that session in particular? What I remember was Linda McCartney was there and she had a huge camera with a huge, well, small camera with a huge lens on it. And she was shooting right over my shoulder at the session while I was trying to play. She was right to the right of me, shooting right in back of me at everybody. So I remember her and I remember Paul standing around uh, smiling and kind of giving us musical inspiration and, and uh, a couple of little ideas and stuff. Uh, and other than that, I had my head buried in the arrangement. And uh, it, was, it was a magical experience. I can't, can't deny that. We've, I've had, my son had the opportunity to kind of fist bump him once. And usually I'm not phased too much by celebrity, but when you meet somebody like Paul McCartney, it's almost kind of like meeting the queen, right? I mean, there's, there's yeah. a different, even, even for folks who, I mean, you're looked up to, you're somebody who somebody s people see as a celebrity, but do you as a celebrity still sometimes see other people like that? I mean, like just almost unworldly, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's people, there's colleagues of mine and lots of musicians that, that are very casual about seeing stars and, and other musicians and stuff. I, I think they have, certain people have that rarefied air that they live in. Uh, your Michael Jackson is one of them. Uh, Paul McCartney, whenever you meet a Beatle, you know you're in the presence of greatness. And uh, whenever you meet a Rolling Stone, I feel the same way about that. You know, I got to play, work on Keith Richards' solo record, and that was a real uh, pinch me moment, you know what I mean? A real bucket list thing for me. So I think uh, Elton John has that. I think Cher has that. I think Barbara Streisand has that. So there are the elite of the elite that still... To me, I feel like a fan, a super fan, when I'm with them, and I have to remind myself that I have a job to do and that I'm, I'm working, you know? So, yes, I, I do have people I look up to as stars.